Before their arrival in America in 2001, the Lost Boys of Sudan knew very little about what would be a totally new world for them. For the U.S. government, it was quite a social experiment. America may be a country of immigrants, but it's not often that the State Department organizes an airlift of people who know virtually nothing about the modern world. The Lost Boys were sent all over the place, from Fargo, North Dakota, to Phoenix, Arizona. Joseph Taban Rafino landed in Kansas City. Abraham Yelnial was sent to Atlanta. We never forgot about them and their fellow Lost Boys, and we felt good when it appeared they hadn't forgotten about us. The story will continue in a moment. How you doing? <laughs> long time no see. Hey. 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 How you doing, buddy? How Good are you to doing? see you, man. Been a long time. Yeah. We visited the Lost Boys from time to time over the last 12 years, wanted to be there for the moments they never could have imagined. I hereby declare... Hey, what is girl? On this day, Abraham was one of 92 people from 37 countries to get a new piece of paper. Congratulations, you're a United States citizen. Thank you. A lost boy who now belongs somewhere. Do you think of yourself as an American? Yes. This this home for me. Abraham is so proud of his American passport, he carries it with him wherever he goes. The only papers we have are from America. Are you telling me that that passport in that jacket pocket of yours is the first identity paper you've ever had? This it. For that, you had no document at all? No. Joseph still hasn't gotten a passport. His driver's license was stolen from him in Kansas City. And that was just the beginning. You've had your car flooded. Right. You've been stabbed. Exactly. You've been hit by a car. That's right. Your kitchen was set on fire. Indeed. And you like it here? Uh, you know, things, things happen. There was more bad news at work. Joseph was laid off a few times from his job at a grain company, the victim of the tough economy. He's back at work now, and in his small, dimly lit apartment, still studies medical books, even while his dream of going to med school is slipping away. Do you feel like you've been successful in America? Not at all. My main aim was to go to the school in order to mean to be, what I've said, to be a doctor but things fall apart. So unless you're a doctor, you will not feel that you are successful. That's true. Abraham did graduate from college. Yeah, it's been a long journey, but God bless me. After many 4 a.m. bus rides to school, he got a degree in biblical studies from Atlanta Christian College. Congratulations. So how did you make those roofs? Sasha Chanov, who led those orientation classes back at Kakuma, now runs an organization called Refuge Point, which champions refugees in Africa. He still stays in touch with the Lost Boys. I would say this is one of the most successful resettlements in U.S. history. Wow. Some of them are in law school, some are in medical school. But of course, when you have 4,000 guys or so who arrive, some don't do as well, some struggle. Some have had problems with drugs and alcohol. The few are in jail. But some lost boys who were orphaned by war have been wounded fighting for the U.S. military in Iraq and Afghanistan. Dar Dekan made it out unscathed. So you were in Iraq three, three times. times? Yes. He joined the army after 9-11. I'm a young man able to hold a gun or to go with the other young men in this country who were born here. Why not? That's my duty. So you joined the army because you wanted to give something back to America? Yes. Thank you, America. I want to let the whole world know. Dominic Leake, a friend of Joseph's in Kansas City, wrote a song he says represents the feelings of many lost boys. When I came to this country, I was helped by the government of this country and the people of America. So what I did was I thanked them for the opportunity they gave to me and my fellow lost boy. We were forced into the river. 
Abraham feels he has a mission to make sure people will not forget. He speaks at universities across the country. Here he was at Yale, explaining to students why he believes God kept the boys alive. God kept us alive to be witness of what took place in Sudan. That's the only thing. It's not because we were more important than other than our mother, than father, than brothers of dies, but simply so that we will be witness. It happened a long time ago, so the lost boys don't have too much trouble talking about it. But at night time, do you have a lot of nightmares? Oh, indeed, a lot. During the young age, where we where we were when I was there, we we're not supposed to see the dead body or bury the dead body and we did that and that's all come like sometimes in form of dream for the lost boys the most momentous news came in july of 2011 their long suffering homeland south sudan was declared the world's newest nation you saw the independent celebrations on your cell phone yeah how did it make you feel oh i was overwhelmed going into tears they were an important factor that led to that independence. Hang on. They were an important factor that led to the independence? I think so. They created a, a political environment in the U.S. where people were finally realizing what was happening in this remote genocide in Sudan that nobody had really heard of on a large scale before. Not long ago, Sudanese flocked by the hundreds to a town called Awil for a celebration. It wasn't Independence Day or anything like that. They came to a newly built brick cathedral to witness the installation of that preacher named Abraham as the first Episcopal bishop of his region in South Sudan. Accepted and invested. Accepted and invested. And now to be inducted. And now to be inducted. A lost boy no more. It's Bishop Abraham now. And who knows what's coming next? Maybe your next name will be Archbishop. I don't know about that. <laughs> Abraham divides his time now between Africa and America. Not only is he an Anglican bishop, but a husband and a father. Oh, my heavens. This is your family. Yes. He goes back to Africa whenever he can to visit his new family. He got married in Kenya, has four kids. He wants them to join him in Atlanta, but red tape keeps getting in the way. Well, I would love that to happen, Bob. I've been tried for them to come, but did not come. Maybe one day somebody will surprise me that you and your kids come to America. Joseph hasn't gone back to Africa, has had no reason to. His whole family was dead as far as he knew. Then, incredible news. His mother, Perina, was alive had survived the war, had made it to a refugee camp in Uganda. And there was another miracle, Skype. So a few months ago, Joseph ironed his best suit and went over to his mentor's house. His mother had been driven three hours to the offices of IOM, the International Resettlement Agency in South Sudan. It was the first time mother and son were going to see each other since they were separated by war 25 years ago. Hello. Hello. How are you? You missed. Mom. Angai. Mom. Mom. How are you? Angai. Mom. Atari. How are you? I'm going to go to bed. His mother had thought Joseph was dead, had held a funeral service for him. Even now, she had no idea what he'd been through. When Joseph tried to tell her, he just couldn't get through it. But there were light moments, too shared memories of Joseph's happy childhood in a country village before the war ended childhood and everything else. And of course, his mother wanted to know why, after all these years, Joseph had not married a nice American girl. After almost an hour, their time was almost up. 
His mother asked Joseph what all mothers ask their sons, when will you come see me? And Joseph answered the only possible answer. Okay? As soon as I can, Mom. As soon as I can. Come on, you miss. Come on. Go to 60minutesovertime.com for the amazing 12-year journey that our team took with the Lost Boys. Sponsored by Pfizer.